We're going to start off with a panel. It's a how ra should rationalists approach death, and our moderator is Jesse Galef. He is the communications director at the SSA. So give it up, Jesse. Awesome. Wow. It's so fantastic to be here. I've been looking forward to this panel for a long time. Uh, we have an interesting topic for fantastic panelists. Uh, and really, it's, it's a tough subject, death. I mean, we're in the atheist community. I know that it's something we get asked about a lot. And the answers are very different than the answers given in the religious community. But that doesn't mean we can't go a little bit further and examine what we mean by death. Um, if I can take a moment of personal privilege, this is something that means a little bit more right now. Uh, friends of Skepticon and personal friends of mine, Phil and Robin Ferguson, just lost their nephew to meningitis, and so they can't be here with us today. Raised a lot of thoughts, made me think about it. No easy answers, but fortunately we have a panel here to discuss it. We're going to try to get through it. Um, I'm sure we'll sell it all in 45 minutes. <laughs> Go home. Um, and by the way, this is probably justifying a lot of people's fears. We have a real death panel. <laughs> and atheists are in charge. So, if I could get the panelists to come up here. I can't believe I got these people on my panel. I'm just thrilled. They're fantastic. I have so much respect for all of them. Uh, Greta Christina, author, blogger, speaker extraordinaire. I see you know her already. Um, her writings appeared in multiple magazines and newspapers, including Miss Magazine, Penthouse, The Chicago Sun-Times, and Skeptical Inquirer. Uh, I've known her for a couple of years, and I'm just so glad that she's becoming a more prominent face and voice in the secular community. Uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky co-founded the nonprofit Singularity Institute, where he works as a full-time research fellow specializing in friendly AI research. Uh, you heard his excellent talk a little bit earlier today, I believe at 11. <laughs> Eliezer is the only one I have not met in person, but I've been reading his work for years now. Uh, it's been really influential for me, and as he said, the Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality fanfic is absolutely spectacular. I will evangelize this every day if I can. James Croft is a doctoral candidate at Harvard, where he studies free thinking in nat the nature of and development of intellectual autonomy. Uh, he's a research and education fellow at the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard, where he's central in the development of the Humanist Community Project, an effort to research the non-religious communities and provide resources to help them in building these communities. Um, he said he was raised on Star Trek, Shakespeare, and Sagan. He's a singer, actor, teacher, and a proud gay humanist. As the fourth panelist, we have Julia Galef. She's a science writer with a background in statistics. Uh, she's on the board of the New York City Skeptics, co-hosts the Rationally Speaking podcast, gives lectures, talks, and moderates panels on rationality and critical thinking. Uh, she also blogs at Rationally Speaking, Three Quarks Daily, and a joint blog with her and me on Measure of Doubt. I've known her my entire life, <laughs> and it's been a pleasure. I really admire everyone up here, and forget one more round of applause for everyone. <laughs> so death, where to begin? The end is a good beginning. Well done. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we mean with death. Um, people have tried to define mortality and immortality in different ways. Um, many, there are many conceptions of immortality, including the idea that we live on through our children, that we live on through our works, um, and, for example, that there's an afterlife. Um, how do these fit in with your conception of mortality? Uh, I know, Julia, you've written about this. Would you like to start? Sure. Um, is this on? Great. This, I've moderated 
panels for years now, and this is the first panel I've actually been on, so it's very disconcert disconcerting to be on the other side of the, of the divide. Um, well, I've, I've written sort of informally uh, on various blogs about death and, and various ways that people talk to themselves about death and um, things that they tell themselves, and especially ways that they define immortality to make themselves feel like they have it. Um, so one of, uh, one of the blog posts that I wrote touching on this topic was when Martin Gardner died about, I guess, two years ago now, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, Martin Gardner, uh, if, for those of you who haven't heard of him, was a, a fantastic, he was a polymath, essentially. There's so few polymaths uh, ever or, or these days. And, and he was definitely one. He, he wrote a fantastic column about the wonders of math and puzzles and logic and, uh, in, in Scientific American. And he published dozens and dozens of books. And he, he really enriched my childhood. Um, so when he died, I, I wanted to write a tribute to him on uh, Rationally Speaking, which is where I was primarily blogging at the time. And I found an interview that he'd done with uh, some magazine a few years before his death, in which he mentioned that one of his favorite books that he'd written, maybe his favorite book that never got mentioned, and he was very sad that it never got any attention, was called, I think it was called The Wise of a Philosophical Scrivener. And it was just this very personal philosophical book uh, with his musings about a number of things, but primarily death. About half of the book was about death, and Martin Gardner was terrified of death, and I mean, he just had a horror of not existing. And so anyway, so in the book, he talks about some of the things that people have tried to tell him to comfort him about death before. Um, and he, he just talks very sort of bitterly about how uncomforting they actually were. So, so one, uh, one like comforting saying about death is uh, that you'll live on through your ideas that you spread in the world. And of course, he spread many ideas in the world. And you'll, you'll live on through your works. Um, and I forget if he quoted Woody Allen or if I, it just reminded me of this quote by Woody Allen, who said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my works. I want to achieve immortal immortality through not dying. <laughs> <laughs> and Martin Gardner was, was very, uh, very much of the same mind. Um, and so I, I mean, I, I talked in the blog post about my sort of personal reactions to some of these uh, comforting or not so comforting thoughts. And I disagree with Martin Gardner in some things, but the one thing on which I really agree with him was on the sort of vapidity of some of the uh, attempts to comfort people about death. So he, he cited this one poem by, oh, I can't remember the poet now, Clow, I think, um, who said something about, uh, I'm, I'm not going to remember it in rhyme, but it was something about how uh, even though I'm, I must die, it comforts me to know that truth will, will always be truth. And Martin Gardner said <laughs> very witheringly, thank you, uh, poet Clow, for that utterly vapid thought. <laughs> like, I am not at all comforted by the fact that after I die, two plus three will still be five. That's, that doesn't make any difference to me. Um, and so I, I, shared, I shared his frustration at that kind of sentiment. Uh, well, I want to riff off of that uh, a little bit, because uh, I've written a lot about, you know, what we can find comforting in the face of death and the face of mortality. And um, I, there's two thoughts that I have about that. One is that I think that we tend to overthink what we mean by comfort and what we mean by consolation. We tend to think that if there's something, some philosophy or approach to death that's comforting, that it's therefore going to make grief and fear of death disappear, that it's going to obliterate, that it's going to make it go, oh, well, in that case, death is totally not a problem and I don't have to worry about it. And, and I don't think that's the case. I think that um, certainly I have a number of philosophies and thoughts about death that do make me feel better about it and make me able to see it with a certain degree of peace. But it's not like it makes me feel like it's a non-issue and like, you know, when the people that I love are, are dying or near death, or when I contemplate my own death, it's not like I'm just like, la la la, who cares, I'm going to just eat chocolate and watch Buffy. Um, you know, it, it, it's not like it's a non-issue, it's that it makes it not overwhelming. It makes me not panic and feel just gripped in the, in the, it makes it not intolerable. And so I think that when we're talking about comfort about death, we need to not think, oh, because we can't find the magic bullet that takes the sting away completely, therefore it's a failure. It's, it's, it's more like it's harm reduction. Um, and, you know, when, and the other thing that you're saying about, you know, these philosophies of death that, you know, you or Martin Gardner might find vapid, 
um, different people find different philosophies very uh, comforting or not comforting. You know, there, there are some people who are, for instance, very comforted by the idea that, um, you know, well, uh, you know, death isn't going to, being dead isn't going to be any worse than not having been born. Hmm. You know, there's that, that's the, the common, you know, Mark Twain said, it's like, I don't fear death. I, you know, I was dead for millions of years before I was born and it didn't trouble me. Um, th there are many people who are like, oh, yeah, that's true. Being dead, that's not going to be an issue. I personally don't find that very comforting because for me, it's not the being dead that I'm afraid of. It's that, it's not that I'm afraid of being dead, it's that I like being alive. <laughs> um, um, and, and that I don't want to lose it. I value my life, I value my consciousness, I don't want to lose that. And so for me particularly, that, that philosophy isn't comforting, but that doesn't mean that it's, that, we, that I shouldn't therefore talk about it, that as atheists and non-believers, we shouldn't therefore be getting that idea out into the world, because somebody else might say, oh, that's true, and that's wonderful, and now I can kind of relax a little bit. So, you know, there's a lot, I think that we, we, again, we don't need to find the one magic bullet that's gonna make death not be terrifying at all, and we don't need to try to find one philosophy that's gonna work for everybody, because that's not gonna happen. Uh, is this on? Yes. Yep. Let me be honest with you. My friends, I am against death. <laughs> <laughs> my opinion on the subject is not complicated, I think it is bad. <laughs> I am, you know, sometimes life doesn't have to be complicated. What does two plus two equal? Four. What does two plus two really ultimately equal? Four. It's still four, even if you speak the question in a deep, pretentious tone of voice. There's, there's, there's this tendency to think that if you speak a problem in a sufficiently pretentious tone of voice, it requires this clever, counterintuitive answer, um, which a lot of things don't. So life is good, death is bad, health is good, sickness is bad. If you can live to 70 years, living to 80 years is better. Living to 500 years is even better. Living to a million years is better than that. And when people ask me, but would you want to live forever? I say, well, I don't really know. Forever is a long time. Pick any finite number you like. Forever is longer than that. <laughs> I don't know if it's physically possible. It, um, the current laws of physics say no. Um, we may not know the laws of physics, but have no particular reason to believe that the unknown variables will work in our favor rather than against us. Um, but nonetheless, you know, if I could live forever, I would. I want to live one more day. Tomorrow I will still want to live one more day. Therefore, I want to live forever. Proof by induction on the positive integers. <laughs> and with respect to the sort of skeptical atheist community in particular, um, I think a lot of us are, tend to be a too accommodationist toward religion, like Richard Dawkins. He's way too soft on religion. <laughs> and, and, and in particular, I think that there's all these sort of bad habits of thought apart from the particular content of religion. Like, it's good to believe without questioning is a sort of habit of thought that apart from any particular content, any particular God is a bad habit of thought to pick up. And similarly, if you think about what religion must say about death, they must claim it as part of a greater plan. They can't be like, oh yeah, that thing that God could have easily prevented, that's a pointless tragedy. They must claim there are silver linings. They must claim we shouldn't be afraid. Atheism doesn't have to claim these things. The question is, should we even be trying to console ourselves at all? Is that the right thing to do? It's not without question that we should be trying to make ourselves angrier at death and rouse ourselves to action so humanity can get its act together and not this year, not next year, not in 10 years, but someday and probably before we spread that much further out into the galaxy, clean up our act and stop dying all the time. I'll do my best not to speak in a deep and portentous tone of voice, although it comes naturally to me. <laughs> <laughs> What I've just heard reminds me of Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. 
And I think there's something of value in that philosophy, although I think I take a slightly different one. I have to admit, I was terrified when I was asked to sit on this panel. It brought to mind one of my favorite cultural references from Star Trek IV. The, <laughs> all my references are actually from Star Trek IV. Um, <laughs> the discussion between Spock and McCoy about death. And McCoy says, come on, Spock, it's me, McCoy. You have to love the accent, right? I'm trying really hard. <laughs> you really have gone where no man has gone before. Can't you tell me what it felt like? It would be impossible to discuss the subject without a common frame of reference. You're joking. You mean I have to die to discuss your insights on death? Forgive me, doctor. I am receiving a number of distress calls. <laughs> And that's how I felt. I felt I should probably receive some distress calls and uh, get out of having to talk about this. Um, but I come to this question as a humanist, and unapologetically so, Pache Dave Silverman this morning. Um, because humanism to me means a whole lot more than atheism. Although there is one thing I agree with Dave on, which is that closets suck. Get out of the damn closet. And whichever one it is. When I um, was thinking about humanist responses to death, I turned to a philosopher called Algernon Black, and he wrote, the important thing is not to fear death, but to fear not living. The real tragedy would be to know in the last days and the final hours that we had never used our gifts. Being human should mean that we strive to live for the values which give life meaning. In other words, we believe in life before death, and for me, this is summed up uh, by a brilliant section in the musical Rent, where they sing, There's only us, there's only this. Forget regret, or life is yours to miss. No other road, no other way, no day but today. That's the humanist philosophy in a nutshell. And I believe that because life is so very short, yeah, <laughs> no day but today. We have about a thousand months if we're lucky and if Eliezer doesn't succeed, which I hope that he does. And a third of those months we're asleep. And so that brings to me the importance of honestly confronting death, looking it squarely in the face and recognizing in the words from Star Trek Generations, Time is the fire in which we burn. So for me, death is a spur to moral action. What the hell are we waiting for? And not just my own death, but the deaths of millions of people every year who never have a chance to have a real life because they die of hunger, preventable disease, poverty, and other things that we could do something about. So that's basically what I think about the matter. So we've, we've started to bring up some of the, we seem to agree that death is largely bad. Is that fair? Um, but the question is then, or there, one of the questions, one of the many questions, is are there silver linings? What silver linings are there and how should we view those silver linings? I think that's trying to, to sum up uh, what was going to be at least four different questions that I was going to ask. But in what ways does death improve life in some way or another. I'm going to hopefully start at the other end and quote something that James wrote. Uh, we see this as no reason to despair. We reject the idea that the understanding of our imminent death saps meaning and significance from our lives. Rather, we see this realization as infusing our lives with rich color, stunning beauty, blazing significance. The very brevity of our lives enhances their brightness. Now, is that, do you view that as a silver lining of our mortality? Okay, well, this is something I've actually written about at some length, so I'll, I promise not to speak about it at some length, but I want to speak about it briefly. Um, and I'm only going to speak for myself. Um, I know that for me, uh, death, I experience death as a deadline, and I'm a very deadline-driven person. Um, you know, it, and I would, I would love to think of myself as the kind of person who, if I were immortal, I would spend immortality doing, you know, wonderful things, I would write novels, I would go to Africa and, you know, take care of hungry people, you know, I would, you know, travel around the world. I know myself. If, if I were immortal, I would spend eternity sitting on the sofa watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer reruns. Um, 
because I have time, because I have all the time in the world and I can do all that other stuff later. I can, you know, write the novels and cure world hunger later. And, I, you know, it's, it's a, essentially, I, I know this because the reason why I'm doing the work that I'm doing is that I had a midlife crisis when I turned 40 about 10 years ago. And, uh, and I was like, I've been dicking around my whole life. I've been saying I want to be a writer, I want to be an activist, and I wasn't doing very much about it. And when I turned 40, I was like, I don't have much time to take care of that. Um, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it now. Um, and so, now does that mean that if, you know, we, if we, I could, you know, if I could have immortality, would I say no to it? Probably not. You know, I'm, you know, the product of, you know, hundreds of millions of evolution of animals who really wanted to live. Um, uh, but, you know, so I'm not saying that I, that if immortality were handed to me, I would say no to it. But given that, as far as I'm aware, I am mortal, um, I'm, I can frame death as a deadline and as something that spurs me to action. And then there's a flip side of that, which is that death also spurs me to experience my life now and to really be in the moment and to savor every moment as much as I can. Uh, because, you know, as, as, you know, when I let go of my religious and spiritual beliefs, which is funny because my religious and spiritual beliefs were very woo and very all about be here now, and yet as a non-believer, I feel like I do live in the moment much more than I ever did because I feel like this is it. I don't have that many more moments. And so, and I know, again, I'm a procrastinator. If I thought I had an infinity of moments, I would totally just piss them away. I think the silver lining there isn't really worth that cloud. I mean, what I'm hearing here is if we make you immortal, we also need, like, uh, noradrenergic-based uh, pharmaceutical to slightly increase your drive to make up for the fact that you're immortal. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that, that, uh, that, but that's what a silver lining means. A silver lining doesn't mean it's better than the cloud. It means given that the cloud exists, how can we, you know, given that mortality exists, given that death exists, how can we live with it in a way that, A, makes us not just want to run screaming, and B, enables us to, to, to improve our lives in some way? Um, well, I mean, the... The, the sort of basic part I'd question there is how inevitable is death exactly, especially death as we know it now. Um, the death of the universe, if our current understanding of the laws of physics is correct, is inevitable, but it's not really death as we currently know it. It's not the kind of, it's not the kind of death we're trying to come to terms with right now. Um, and to the extent that, I mean, if it were genuinely inevitable, if there were no prospect, no, no substantial probability of doing anything about it, then there might be some argument to focus on the silver linings, steer your thought away from any particular screaming existential horrors you may happen to have, um, try to sort of make the best of it. But the trouble with trying to make the best of it is that you really do in practice see people who, are, who go on trying to make the best of a bad situation long after they could have gotten out of it. I mean, the very classic quote is that when the smallpox um, vaccinations were being developed, uh, inoculations, rather, were being developed, um, the, like, smallpox is a judgment upon the, of Jehovah upon the people. <clears throat> to avert it is only to provoke him more. Um, it's an encroachment upon the prerogatives of Jehovah, whose right it is to wound and smite was what was said before they started uh, tossing uh, lighted bombs into the windows of smallpox inoculation um, proponents, who, to be fair, um, was being sheltered at the time by a priest who was on the side of smallpox inoculation. Um, because back then there were good priests. Um, <laughs> so I, th I think that our civilization is getting to the point where there's, people are starting to say, let's do something about this stuff. There's people who are doing basic anti-aging research and want more money for basic anti-aging research. Um, this subject is inevitably going to come up, so I might as well raise it. There's this thing called, well, suppose that when you were almost about to die, we could put you on a spaceship, send you away from Earth at nearly the speed of light, have you turn around, come back at nearly sp the speed of light, so very little subjective time has elapsed. And when you get back, technology has advanced to the point where they can cure you. We can't do that because we can't accelerate things to nearly the speed of light. What we can do 
is pump them full of antifreeze and cool them down. So that's cryonics. Um, the co most common reply is ice damage. The reply to that is they put, you, they like pump you full of cryoprotectant and vitrify you. Like not, you are not frozen with ice crystals, you are vitrified. I'm signed up for that. It's what I'm doing about death. Um, my primary, Aaron, is signed up for that. Um, and to me the comfort is there are things I can do about death and I'm doing them and having done them, I'm sort of finished. I don't need to rationalize it. I, I don't need to try and make it out to be a good thing. I've, I've, I'm striking the, what blows I can. To me, that seems sufficient. Like, I don't think you need to come with any, any further terms with it than that. Can I comment on uh, actually a couple of things? The question of whether the brevity of our lives make them s all the sweeter. Um, I, I definitely feel the pull of the kind of reasoning, Greta, that you're giving, but I, I also feel that, like, it's easy for me to, to make the analogy to a weekend where Friday night is wonderful because not only do I not have to go to school, I get to think about how much more time I have left in the weekend and that makes it so much better and, and, you know, same for Saturday, only a little less so, and then Sunday, I don't have to go to school, but the whole time is just tinged by this, oh, I have to go back to school in the morning. Um, and, and I also think that, you know, people, Given how, how little time people have, I think a lot of people are more selfish than they would be if they had more time. Like, like there, are a lot, there are a lot of large, difficult projects you could undertake to help other people, to make the world a more interesting or a better place. But then you look at your life and you're like, I have you know, 40 years left and I want a family and I want to do these other things for myself and it's just not worth it, you know? And if you didn't have that kind of trade-off to make, uh, I just think the world might potentially be a more um, altruistic place. Um, and then just briefly, while I have the floor, uh, the question of the potential dangers of seeking out comforting thoughts about death. We touched on the, Eliezer talked about the fact that it might make you um, sort of sanguine, complacent, when there is in fact something you could maybe be doing to ameliorate the situation. And I, I've been thinking about this recently. I think there's another danger too. So I think the danger is that it could make you a worse rationalist. And, I, this isn't obvious, and it wasn't obvious to me for a while, because when you take comfort in things, you're not, it's not like you're lying to yourself. You're not believing a, a claim about the world that isn't true, like, well, I mean, unless it's, I'm going to live forever. Um, that would be a claim that's, that you don't have good reason for believing. But I'm talking about seeking out just these kinds of thoughts, like, like well, uh, truth will go on existing without me, and um, while I didn't exist before my death, or before I was born, and so why should it trouble me if I don't exist, you know, in 40 years hence? Um, so those aren't, I mean, you're not judging their truth or falsity as, uh, like, propositions and doing it wrongly, you're just seeking comfort. So it doesn't seem obvious immediately why that would be bad for you as a rationalist, but I think that it trains you in this kind of habit to flinch away from unpleasant things and to seek out things that are pleasant. And so even if in this context that weren't harmful for you, I think it's a bad habit for a rationalist to be in. Um, and I, I think you also, like, so let's take the example of, was it Mark Twain you quoted who said that, right, that, you know, it didn't, I didn't live before, right, right, right. And so that, like, if you want to be comforted, you could just listen to that, think, okay, I feel comfort, I'm gonna stop thinking about it now because I feel comfort. But if you thought about it more, you might notice contradictions with other things that you think you believe. So, like, I read a thought experiment, uh, I think it was by a philosopher named Thomas Nagel, who, he was talking about that particular argument, and he said, well, uh, let's imagine a man who, uh, in middle age, he suffers a, a brain injury, and he's reduced to the state of essentially a newborn infant. Um, we feel like that's a bad thing, even though he was a newborn infant before. Um, so he's just returning to the state he was in before. We feel like something was lost there. And again, not, not passing judgment on the truth or falsity of any of these propositions, but my intuition about that contradicts my intuition about the Mark Twain argument. And, and so I know that I, you know, there's a contradiction there. I, I can't feel differently ab about the two if the arguments are really analogous. And that's the kind of thinking that a true, like, a true truth seeker would actually do. They wouldn't just stop thinking about something once they decided they liked it. They would actually look for contradictions with other things that they thought they believe. So wanting comfort can, can sort of, can like 
hamper that, that really good and really virtuous for a rationalist instinct. I think James is, is kind of just very happy. I, uh, I want to speak up for comfort in a certain <laughs> sense. Um, and I want to speak up for it in the sense that it, a lot of these, we're talking about these ideas as simply as frames for looking at death, which makes it easier to bear with. But some of them are literally true. Um, I recently attended the funeral of a father of a very close friend of mine. And I had never met my friend's father. But after attending the funeral service in which many people spoke about him and how he lived, I had the extraordinarily powerful sense that in fact I had met his father because I had met his son and because I knew his son extremely well. And it was abundantly clear to me that it was literally true that the values that his father espoused and the way that he lived his life did literally live on in how his son lived his life and how he dressed and how he acted towards other people. And so I don't think it's merely just a frame for thinking about death. One of the ways we make concrete impact in this world is literally through the things we write and leave behind, through the people we affect. And these are very, indeed, if we want to be physicalist about it, which I don't think is necessary, but these are also physical impacts, right? We're literally imprinting ourselves in other people's consciousness. And that is a very real, tangible way in which we leave parts of ourselves behind. Um, and very briefly on the subject of freezing oneself, um, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on this topic, but it seems to me that given the current state of technology, isn't this just a very comforting thought, essentially? The idea that we might one day be resurrected because we've frozen ourselves? It may be, it may be um, a slightly more rigorously determined possibility, um, but I, I see no reason to believe that such a technology is even on the horizon if it is remotely possible and why we might not imagine that there are other more outlandish resurrection technologies that could resurrect us without freezing us um, way far in the future. And you could save all that money or even give it to people who are dying from hunger. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so to, to sort of unwind that in order, um, first of all, how come, you know, like why not, how about if you like just sort of cut out all the Starbuckses and sign up for Chronix and then use the leftover money and send it to Africa? Like why does Chronix, which is actually saving a life, have to be the first thing on your list of expenditures that gets targeted in favor to, um, nonetheless, an attempt to save a life if you like. Um, second, um, okay, so why can't you have an even more sophisticated technology that works without freezing people? Because physics is local in space and time. Events are only affected by their immediate neighbors in space and time. If you know a space of simultaneity, like you know a snapshot of the universe in the present, you know everything that you could possibly know that affects the future, regardless of what happens in the past. So to have a time camera where the picture now is causally affected by the state of the distant past would require a very drastic change in basic physical law. Whereas for chronics to work, requires only that we not be surprised. If our present generalizations about biology, neurology, and physics are true, chronics should work. Now, it hasn't, you, you can't actually test the proposition that the um, future technology in the other end will be good enough until you're in the future. But it's sort of like global warming, in the sense that we don't, we don't have proof that the temperature will rise by six degrees in 2100, but it's, for it like not to do that, pumping a sufficiently large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we'd have to learn some new scientific fact we don't presently know. So chronics is not the scientific result, but it is the prediction of our existing scientific generalizations. I would put a better than 50% probability on it working, assuming that humanity survives, which I think is the sort of like key weakness in that particular. Uh, but, but if it doesn't survive, then and it's probably not as much money as you think. Like, I pay $170 per year for $250,000 worth of life insurance of what $50,000 goes to the Chronic Institute in the event of my death. $50,000 is not a lot of money to save a life in the first world. This is how I can tell I chose panelists well. They carry on the conversation without my prodding them in the direction I wanted them to go anyway. Um, we've been talking about using dif different frames for death. What makes for a good frame? I know that atheists and rationalists have 
sets of framings that we tend to use, ways to describe death, things that we say about it. And religious people have other ways to discuss it, particularly afterlife and, and ways of seeking comfort. Um, we touched on this, and I'd like to get a little bit more in the amount of time we have left, um, about what makes a view better, and whether it's purely about personal preferences, or whether there is an element of truth and rationality to it. Uh, well, I would say certainly as atheists and skeptics and rationalists, the number one thing about any philosophy of death is that it has to be, it has to jive with reality, it has to jive with evidence. And, it, and it's related to that, it has to be flexible enough that if new evidence comes along, then we will change, you know, that we'll change our view. Um, you know, I don't want a view of death that's inconsistent with reality. That's why I'm an atheist. That's why I let go of religious beliefs. And in fact, um, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. There's some research that was done recently showing that uh, religious believers uh, are actually more likely to engage in very intense end-of-life interventions than the non-believers, you know, suggesting that for all of this propaganda they have about how religion is so comforting in the face of death, that when people, religious believers are really faced with death, they're a lot more scared than we are. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, it's, and I, and I think that we actually concede the ground of death much too easily. We concede the ground that, oh, there's so many atheists who have said, there's no way you could ever come up with a philosophy of death that's more comforting than religion. I don't think that's true. Um, and if for no other reason, again, speaking from my own experience, when I was a religious believer, I had these beliefs that I found comforting, but I wasn't willing to question them very far. There was a level at which I was not willing to ask questions, and living in a state of cognitive dissonance is not a very comforting place to live. And I actually feel much more at peace with death than I did as a religious believer because I feel like my philosophies of death are evidence-based. And so I agree with you, Julia, that we shouldn't seek comfort to the point where we're no longer willing to investigate, to the point where we're no longer willing to question. Uh, but I do think that as long as our philosophies are, you know, consistent with evidence and are willing to be, you know, to change in the face of evidence, you know, I don't, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't frame life in a way that enables us to really engage with it in a joyful way as opposed to just having existential freakouts every six seconds, you know. All right. Um, now that we've settled all the important questions of thought. <laughs> what should we do? Should we be investing in cryonics? How much? Should we be looking into anti-aging technology? How much? Is this more important than poverty to you? Is this more important than global warming, which is another possible existential threat? Nuclear proliferation, for example, is an existential threat that could keep us from getting to the point Eliezer is hoping to achieve, um, both in terms of technology, or if that's not uh, really the way that we think is, is a little bit too futuristic to think about, should we be comforting people and how? I know this is a big question, but uh, you guys seem to be going off onto glorious tangents. I want to encourage this. Well, first I'm going to look into my life insurance policy and see, I'm, I'm coming increasingly convinced that this is the way to go. Um, but I, I think that, yes, one convert, maybe, maybe not. Um, I think the one thing we can do, and it's not such an individual thing, but we're very engaged with this at Harvard, is to build real communities for non-religious people. Because one of the things that religious um, traditions provide are social networks where people come together to share each other's lives and trials. And I think that one of the things that really terrifies people is not so much the actual um, uh, being dead, but is the process of dying. And I think that the, another piece from Rent, where they sing, Will I lose my dignity? Will someone care? Will I wake tomorrow from this nightmare? That's what people are really worried about. You don't have to applaud every time they sing. People are worried about a loss of dignity, and they're worried that there won't be anyone there for them. And I think for many non-religious people, that's sadly going to be the case. Because in our society, religious institutions are very often the ones which take up that slack and send people to the bedsides and the hospitals that have hospice chaplains there to deal with people's existential concerns at times of death. And they have narrative frameworks 
symbols, ceremonies, music and poetry, all related to that religious tradition that will help people through this process if it ever comes. And I think that one of the best things we could do is build structures that provide some of those communal resources to people who are not religious and who currently don't have them. I guess um, the most important message I might have to give on the topic of how to deal with death is it's all right to be angry. It's all right not to be comforted. Um, for me, the prototype of this experience will always be the funeral of my little brother who died at the age of 19. And I went to his funeral. Um, I was the only open atheist there, I believe. And for me, there was no confusion in that experience. Pure anger, pure wishing it didn't happen. No need to seek comfort for it. And that may not have been a pleasant experience, but I think that it was in a fundamental sense more healthy for being less conflicted than what I saw on the faces of my relatives and my parents as they tried to attribute it to God. Yehuda Yudkowsky is dead. There is nothing left of him. He does not live on in me. He's dead. That's all. And maybe someday I'll contribute to laying the reaper, if not forever, then at least for a few billion years, and maybe then I'll feel better, or maybe I won't. But the point is, I'm not conflicted. I know what I'm doing about it. And it's all right to feel the same way, despite all the people telling you about ways to come to terms with death. It's all right to say, no, I won't come to terms with it. It's just evil. So I'm actually surprisingly going to agree with at least some of that. Um, I, you know, again, when I talk about, you know, I, I do think that there are philosophies and approaches to death that can make us come to terms with that, but I also think that we can be upset about it, we can be angry about it, we can grieve horribly, and I do think that that's a, that is another advantage that we have over religious believers. Um, I know there are a lot of religious believers who in the face of death, they do have this sense of conflict, they have this sense of, you know, they're supposed to feel like it's okay because I'm going to see them in heaven in a few years anyway, and yet they're grieving horribly as if they're never going to see them again. And we don't have to do that. I think that we can say it's okay to grieve, it's okay to feel upset, it's okay to feel angry. And I don't think that that's actually in contradiction with saying at the same time, we have philosophies that we can use to, f to frame this. Um, you know, we have ways of thinking about this that can make us at least be able to get on with our lives with some measure of peace. Um, and I agree with James about forming communities to support one another, to create rituals around death. And I would also really just like to see us talk about this more and get our ideas about death out into the world more. Because I do think that there is this assumption on the part of a lot of atheists and believers, again, that death is the trump card, that they're, that they're always going to win because their philosophies of death are more comforting. I don't think that's true. And I think that the more that we are willing to not shy away from this and to talk about, here is how atheists see death. And it's actually, it's actually okay. You know, you can be an atheist and deal with death and not have it overwhelm and swallow your life whole. Um, and I think that the more we get these philosophies out into the world, um, including the philosophy that, you know, death sucks and we don't have to, to, to pretend that that's not true. Um, because different philosophies are gonna resonate with different people. And the more we do that, the more we don't shy away from this topic, I think that the better we're gonna be as a community and the, the, the more of a safe place to land we're gonna create for people who are questioning religion. I've, I've been trying to think about what I personally find comforting, because I've been talking about stuff that I don't find comforting and I've been talking about arguments against comfort. Um, but there is one thing that I've personally found comforting in thinking about death. Um, I've, I've, known, I've been lucky not to have anyone really, really close to me die uh, yet, but, but I have known people who, uh, who I cared about who died, um, several of whom died much earlier than they had expected they would. And, and several of them, I, what I found so inspiring was that they had this kind of 
just nonchalance, like laughing in the face of death kind of attitude. Um, and I, you know, it didn't, it didn't mean that they, they weren't doing everything they could to try to fight whatever it was that, um, that, was, that was causing them to die. But they didn't, they weren't like beaten by death. They weren't kind of crushed by death. Um, their spirits weren't broken. And in kind of a weird, almost self-fulfilling way, I, I feel like if I, I've, I've thought about what I would do if I, um, you know, found out, like I had a terminal illness. And I think that the thing that would be the most, like what gives me comfort now in looking ahead to that possibility is thinking that I could do that same thing for other people. Like I could be that inspiring example of someone who gives them comfort by showing that, you, you know, you don't have to be completely broken by the fact that you're going to die. And so it's kind of self-fulfilling in a way uh, just because, well, it's not entirely self-fulfilling because I think there's a lot of, anecdotal evidence and empirical research that shows that people tend to be able to get over grief and get over panic and so on when they feel like they're doing something for someone else. You know, um, parents can get through really difficult times just thinking for the sake of their children. And so if I think about setting a really good example for other people to help lessen some of their pain and their grief, then it actually helps me, like, genuinely. Um, and this is all sort of conditional on the fact that, like, okay, you have, like, six months left. You know, this is sort of not, there's nothing that you personally can do, really, to help extend, you know, uh, transhumanist or cryonics technologies. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm sort of hedging my bets. Like, I want to know that I have a game plan in place in case I need it for comfort, but I also don't want to sort of go straight to comfort just yet. Like, I want to have both plans set up. Do we have time for Q&A? Yeah. Not even a little Q&A? We started late. All right. I'm sorry, guys. I think that has to wrap it up. These panelists have been fantastic. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> they will be around all weekend to answer all of your questions. I'm volunteering them now. Um, and thank you all so much for coming and being a part of this. It's a fantastic experience here at Skepticon, and it's been wonderful being able to moderate this.